Hare Om Namaha. It's unavoidable that you have an idea, an image, an implicit conception, a representation in your mind of who and what Srila Prabhupada was as the founder Acharya of the Western manifestation of the Hare Krishna movement. This is a given, and in and of itself, it is not an issue. The issue is whether or not you have an accurate conception of who this great personality was, especially in terms of what he accomplished. Prabhupada was the most recent God-realized representative of the disciplic succession known as the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. He came in a line of Uttama Otikaris, stretching back to the beginning of the universal creation. He is no longer physically manifest, of course, and he has not been with us for many decades in that way. Nevertheless, he remains the prominent spiritual master of this above-mentioned Guru Parampara, since no Vaishnava has, in the last 44-plus decades, demonstrated anything remotely similar to the erudition, power, and purity that his divine grace radiated everywhere he went for a little over 11 years during the late 60s and the 70s. Now, we're going to summarize the contents, the topics of this video presentation here. We've just finished topic one, which is the introduction. Thank you for sticking with it. Topic two, which will follow this summarization, is imitation Prabhupads. There's a baker's dozen of them. Topic three is the Nitya Siddha controversy, which we'll discuss along with a, an important excerpt from a 1970 letter. Number four is presuppositions and everything related to presuppositions. This is the most lengthy topic of the presentation. Arguably, it's the most important. And so you, you're urged to pay close attention because it's a little bit complicated. If you do pay close attention, your reward is that you'll be able to get a start of escaping the no-think cults if you're entangled in them. Topic five is the simplistic notion of Prabhupada held by the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation. Now, Ritvik holds it too, but in a very different way. Topics five, six, seven, and eight are all about the wrong perspective held by so-called ISKCON. Topic six, is how that perspective of Prabhupada was enforced. And topic seven is the humanistic fairy tale about Prabhupada. Topic eight is the rubric of personalism used by the old guard, the dinosaurs especially, in other words, they make everything about this humanistic misconception of Prabhupada as being the personalism of bhakti yoga and anything that goes against their fairy tale they allege is a form of impersonalism. Topic nine is the Neomut perspective of Prabhupada, which is highly offensive. Topic 10 is very brief, and it's related to topic 9. It's Prabhupada's God brothers and what their perspective of him was. Topic 11 is, of course, the Ritvik perspective. We can't ignore that. And topic 12 is the right perspective. 
after topic 12 concludes, there will be a brief musical interlude with 12 still shots as part of the video of that music. And topic 13 is the brief but potent conclusion. So let us now proceed to topic 2, the imitation Prabhupada's. Without context, the headline of this video lends itself to a misinterpretation. After Prabhupada left in mid-November of 1977, one of his disciples took the title, quote-unquote, Prabhupada. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada never sanctioned this, but that charismatic had followers of his own even before he took initiation and sannyas from the real Prabhupada in the early 70s. As such, since some of A.C. Bhaktivedanta's initiated disciples were more dedicated to that man than they were to their own Diksha Guru, it is not surprising that he consolidated his following during the heady era of the Zonlacharyas. By being the only one to appropriate that highest title, he created distinction for himself, although technically the Zonals had not gained traction in late 1977. In other words, there was one false Prabhupada in the immediate aftermath of Prabhupada's disappearance. And then, of course, there was Kirtanananda Swami, another charismatic. He had been appointed a Ritvik in the summer of 1977, and in the final week of that year, he began taking Mahapagavat worship at his Moundsville compound from not only new people, but also from initiated disciples of his divine grace through the Prabhupada. Now, Kirtanananda did not take the title of Prabhupada. Instead, he adopted a knockoff, which we all know was quote-unquote Voktipad, de facto another imitation Prabhupada. Then came the fateful meeting with the Navadvip Mahant in the spring of 1978, preceded and followed by the governing body making dreadful decisions to have, in effect, Kirtanananda and his ten other little Indian boys worshipped in their own zones as imitation Acharyas, capital A. They all took titles similar to Kirtanananda's. None of them took the title of Prabhupada, but one did adopt the Vishnupad label, which is considered to be on the same level of devotional elevation as Prabhupada. Not long after that, a dark cloud, who had accepted Kirtanananda as his mentor after being rejected for sannyas by his previous mentor, took a moniker, a moniker indicating that he was the shelter of devotional pilgrimage. This was an imitation of the 11 pretender Mahabhagavats. Although he had no locomotive problem, he imitated Sri the Prabhupada by utilizing a cane as part of his shtick. He was not one of the 11 Ritviks, yet he was an influential second echelon charismatic and predictably secured approval as an initiating guru for so-called ISKCON in due course. As such, these were the baker's dozen of false Prabhupads as of 1980. And yes, only fools followed them. But the headline of this month's video is not about them, at least not directly. Instead, it is about the differing conceptions or rather misconceptions of Prabhupada held by the three chief deviations. It is about the idea that each of these three upasampradayas consider to be who and or what Prabhupada was. As we proceed with these descriptions, let us note in advance that there is one controversy that need not enter into the mix. 
This is the controversy as to whether or not his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, was a Nitya Siddha. We find the following excerpt from a letter to a leading secretary dated Summer Solstice, 1970. Quote, a spiritual master is always liberated. In any condition of his life, he should not be mistaken as ordinary human being. This position of spiritual master is achieved by three processes. One is called sadhana siddha. That means one who is liberated by executing the regulative principle of devotional service. Another is kripa siddha one who is liberated by the mercy of Krishna or his devotee. And another is Nitya Siddha, who is never forgetful of Krishna. Whether I was subjected to the laws of material nature. So even though accepting that I was subjected to the laws of material nature, does it hamper in my becoming spiritual master? What is your opinion? So far I am concerned, I cannot say what I was in my previous life, but one great astrologer calculated that I was previously a physician and my life was sinless." Unquote. As should be obvious to all of you, this loaded excerpt gives grist for the mill to both camps in relation to conflicting opinions as to whether or not Prabhupada was Nitya Siddha. The chief point, however, is that he was Siddha, completely perfect, a fully God-realized spiritual master situated in Krishna Prema. That conception of him is the standard, it is the right one, what he may or may not have been previously is ultimately irrelevant. Now we proceed to the more weighty section of this video, which concerns presuppositions and everything related to them. Religious organizations ultimately rely upon presuppositions. Make no mistake about that. And this principle is applicable also to Upasampradayas. These presuppositions are implicit in most cases, but they formulate to form specific behaviors and actions. We need to be concerned about what such ideas presuppose about His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. We especially need to be concerned in terms of what our founder Acharya brought to the West with the presuppositions held by the three chief splinter groups floating like contagion all over the world today in the West's scattered sunshine of postmodern Kali Yuga. As most of you know by now, these three are known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, Neomat, and Ritvik. There are valuations that every kind of bogus image of Prabhupada automatically promotes. These valuations have consequences in action, especially in interaction between aspiring newcomers and the leaders of these deviant institutions. Such interactions will create a matrix for a specific set of emotions, and when these feelings and emotions are not authorized, they do not lead to bhava. Such flawed preconceptions of Prabhupada embedded in astral complexes will impact the psyches of devotees. Weak devotees will have whatever accurate understanding of Prabhupada they had previously achieved, modified and warped by powerful bad association contracted within the pseudo-bhakti cult of their wrong choice. 
This consequence will then spread by further interaction, but all of it will be mostly subconscious. A psychic contagion too subtle to recognize consciously. It will establish in due course a new pattern of behavior because, as previously mentioned, Prabhupada, as in a wrong conception of him, is still at the center of both so-called Iskan and Ritvik. These designer Prabhupada images were and continue to be tailored to match both individual and social needs within the two cults, thus solidifying wrong ideals about him. Eventually, all of this will be indelibly coded in transaction concepts. And by that point, there's virtually nothing that can be done to help those people out of the trap. The codes create the narrative. The ISKCON narrative is different from the Ritvik narrative, obviously, and this creates psychic conflict. Their theoretical presuppositions of who and what Prabhupada was and is work down to the gross plane, and this sharpens the internal dissension between these two Prabhupada-centered cults. Now, Neomat is an entirely different story because it does not put Prabhupada in the center. On the contrary, it puts him in the periphery. However, that does not mean that some similar principles are not operative within the spheres of influence of those wild cards. The Neomat narrative is highly offensive to Srila Prabhupada, and it is also extremely poisonous for those who unfortunately buy into it. All of this does not necessarily get represented into words, although the biography in so-called Iskan is an exception. It was put into words. Self-serving misconceptions of the founder Acharya are usually not explicitly stated. The so-called biography aside, they do, however, get represented in different ways muddled ways, comprising communication meant to deceive, in no small part due to its lack of clarity. These beliefs spawn moral codes. Wrong images of Prabhupada are based upon such flawed beliefs in potent combination with historical revisionism. This whole network creates a new tradition. That is what an Upasampradaya is all about, a new tradition. The behaviors and communication of members of the deviant cult are in accord with its narrative and moral codes. An integration leading to what is acceptable behavior within the group. Never underestimate the power of such an institution once this complex becomes concentrated. What is being presented to you here is that the whole thing hinges upon presuppositions of who and what his divine grace is and was. When these are dead wrong, it predictably leads to a kind of quasi-stability within the all-pervading contamination of any given cult. Thus, the emotions felt and expressed by its members are kept fully under the control of the powers that be, both above and within it. Now, in the case of Prabhupada's organization, it really had no long-established tradition. Its structure of belief and action, you could say its moral integrity, was both formulated and formed for only a little over a decade. Different concepts and new tools could and did enter it quite easily after he departed physical manifestation. They set the stage for the first transformation. And the second transformation in the mid-80s was nothing more than a reaction to that first transformation. 
both of these, a kind of one-two gut punch, effectively destroyed that previous tradition, which was not very strong anyway, having only been established from the mid-60s until late 1977. In a sense, you could say that the leading secretaries were not prepared for what they encountered. But that is also a bit misleading, since they walked right into it. They were prone to transformation, and they believed that the new dispensation was advantageous to them. Short term, materially speaking, it certainly was. In the intermediate term, however, it created a new and different Prabhupada as part of its consequence. That creation was an abstraction. It was a new image, and it had been previously put into words by the so-called authorized biography. This modification of who Prabhupada was solidified in the minds of the inmates of the cult. Yet, paradoxically, such an explicit representation left the group mindset open to criticism. And your host speaker delivered some of that criticism. That abstraction of the image of Prabhupada and warped memory disrupted the movement in a way too subtle for most to recognize. The social identity was changed. Fundamentals about the founder Acharya were discarded in favor of malleable definitions of his divine grace. This destruction of good memory, or rather loss of intelligence, as to who he was and what he actually accomplished, created the simplistic notion. This attracted sentimentalists to so-called discount or as you may say, simple for the simpletons. A simplistic notion of Prabhupada played right into the hands of the 11 great pretenders, their sycophants, and their hatchet men. So-called ISKCON accordingly created a new simplistic ideology in order to spread its allegedly new and improved movement. Either bona fide or not, Disciplic successions are also to be considered schools. This is accepted in both the East and the West. All such lines, be they personal, impersonal, or occult, are known as schools. Let us begin with the misconception of Prabhupada held by most in the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, a deviant school, as opposed to a wrong school such as Ritvik. Before commencing the description of the concocted image of Prabhupada believed and pushed by so-called ISKCON, let us first remind all of the viewers how it was imposed. It was imposed by force. In the late 70s, you were a demon if you went against the governing propaganda that Prabhupada had appointed 11 of his best men to be, in effect, his successors. You had no place in the movement if you did not accept this institutionally implemented fact, so-called fact. You were a demon and fit to be ostracized if you did not accept that Prabhupada had empowered his 11 most advanced allegedly, leading secretaries as full-blown Diksha Gurus, as Maha Bhagavats, at the highest level of spiritual and devotional realization. You were a demon if you resisted the Prabhupada that was authorized by so-called ISKCON, the one which it demanded you were to now accept. Even if you had been initiated by him, he did not know you. He knew only his pet disciples and his leading secretaries. Your path to his divine grace was only through them. And the zonal acharya system is what they gave you. As such, 
You had to accept it as Prabhupada's will because he did not know you and they gave it to you. Taking these things into consideration, when the so-called biography was given in primature by the governing body, it was the only Prabhupada that everyone was to love, but to love him only remotely because he never knew you. It was full of syrupy sentiment. But more than that, it was full of his leading men and those who had his association in the early days. His pastimes were thus, in effect, their pastimes. His pastimes were to be seen and remembered through their foggy lenses throughout the book's last five volumes. All of this was imposed upon the devotees, referring here mostly to the rank and file, of course, and it created a psychic iron trap for virtually everyone who stayed connected to so-called ISKCON. If you were a malcontent or did not believe the institutional propaganda, you would be inevitably ferreted out. And once that took place, your life would become filled with tribulation and all kinds of trouble. When your host speaker was traveling with Sulochan in his van during the summer of 1985, where I edited his The Guru Business Treatise for him. I soon found out that he was a fan of the so-called biography. I was not, of course. As such, I presented my reasons as to why the multi-volume work was severely flawed and presented Prabhupada in a way that was anything but accurate. This was not made an issue. We kept on with our work because I was not going to allow this difference to impede the reason I had joined him. A few days later, he had a eureka moment. He told me he realized why the so-called biography was the way it was, emphasizing Prabhupada's apparent humanity and hardly even mentioning what to speak of emphasizing his transcendental power and glories. Sulochan told me that the motive of the stupendous book was to bring Prabhupada down to the level where the 11 great pretenders would automatically be considered his equals. Their imposition was crumbling and would crater in less than two years. Their foibles at that time were now apparent to almost all of the devotees. By the mid-80s, however, if the devotees could simply realize, allegedly, that Prabhupada had to work his way through similar situations that they were undergoing at that time in the same way, then that would serve as a buffer for the Zonals. Now, I agreed with Sulochan's realization, and I appreciated it. I saw the so-called biography as pushing a kind of proto-Renaissance humanism coating over the real Prabhupada, a point I had made to Sulochan, and as a fairy tale tactic to minimize his status. Now, I happen to know some historical facts and eyewitness reports that had been discovered by the chief researcher for the so-called biography in India. That godbrother, who was a member of my party in the late 70s and very early 80s, told me that its author would never accept anything that smacked of the miraculous or mystic powers concerning Prabhupada's activities. That author would ignore those researched reports, but he would accept anything which was of the familiar, or to put it more bluntly, more or less mundane. Indeed, amongst printed reviews in the book, virtually all from Western professors glorifying in their own wrong way Prabhupada, one stood out. A renowned East Coast professor said that the multi-volume work presented, quote, a very real story of a very human Srila Prabhupada, unquote. 
Tatvamase Humanistic overcoating of Prabhupada is still extant in so called ISKCON. The biography is still peddled on the cult's websites and via colorful brochures sent out through snail mail. Nothing of substance has been edited from the original publication, and the same mood and sentiments are just what they were when it was first published back in the late 70s. A severely flawed vision of his divine grace. Here was a false Prabhupada, one who needed help, one who was sometimes prone to be disturbed, one who was trying to establish, quote unquote, his American church. Here was a so-called Prabhupada who received a great shock when his wife would no longer follow him and he had to strike out on his own in India without her. Here was a Prabhupada who, quote unquote, had taken quite a shock when he had to leave a messy, unclean loft in the Bowery because the fellow who lived with him in it was prone to drug-induced rants. That loft then suddenly became, in the words of the biography, quote, an insane terror. The street at its door was also a hellish, dangerous place. He was shaken, unquote. And what was Prabhupada's status after he left the Bowery? The so-called biography describes it. Quote, Suddenly, he was as homeless as any derelict in the street. In fact, many of them, with their long-time births in flop houses, were more secure than he. They were ruined, but settled. Unquote. The ISKCON sanctioned biography describes a Prabhupada who was, quote, working without government sponsorship, without the support of any religious organization, without a patron. It meant being vulnerable and insecure, unquote. It described a Prabhupada who was surprised that the youth of America were so discontented with their parents' affluence. Ah, but then a little later in volume two, the biography segues. It segues to the good times when those great early devotees stepped up and into his life and in effect bailed him out, making him joyful again. Quote, the summer of 1966 moved into August and Prabhupada kept good health. For him, these were happy days, unquote. Although Fonzie didn't show up at that time, the second volume is more about those early devotees than it is about Prabhupada. It was more about the fledgling movement than it was about its founder Acharya. It was more about devotee pastimes than it was about Prabhupada's accomplishments. Described further in it as follows, quote, Prabhupada was like an anxious father afraid for the life of his infant Iskhan, unquote. Such sweet and syrupy sentimentalism. However, in the final volume, the biography cuts to the chase. Then it becomes more or less all about the governing body. For example, consider this excerpt. Quote, the GBC chairman then called for a vote on an unresolved topic from the day's meeting. The topic had been discussed, but since it had not been approved, the chairman called for a vote. Everyone voted yes by raising their right hand. Then Srila Prabhupada raised his hand also. His disciples immediately laughed at this endearing gesture. I am simply following the GBC. Whatever you say, I have to follow." Unquote. Did you catch that? Prabhupada is painted as a follower of the governing body, subject to the governing body, under the jurisdiction 
of the governing body. Not at all difficult to figure out what the ramifications and repercussions of believing that would be, is it? In summary, the version of Prabhupada promoted by so-called ISKCON is highly contaminated with humanism, dependency, and subordination to his leading secretaries. Over and above this, the author engages in a form of mind reading. He was not the only one, but his doing it via the multi-volume work was particularly egregious. His lengthy treatise set the foundation for a new kind of consideration of Prabhupada, wherein his mood, whatever that allegedly was, became the be-all and end-all for major decisions and conclusions made by him or about him. All this under the rubric of personalism, of course. But let me repeat that, the rubric of personalism. Those old dinosaurs love to use that as a weapon. It's very effective. Deducing and interpreting his apparent emotions was also okay, although such a thing never is. On the contrary, having the audacity to allegedly decipher the emotions of the Maha Bhagavat is a form of Maha Gurva Parad. In the false Prabhupada of so called ISKCON, you cannot understand or glorify the status of this great Acharya without simultaneously entering the astral can of worms, which constitutes his pet disciples, big guns, and leading secretaries. Indeed, one of the 11 great pretenders, get this now, this is outrageous. One of the 11 great pretenders, now deceased, stated that in the spiritual world, when you go there, you will re-enter a hierarchy just like you had here. You were subordinate here to men who were the only ones who were dear to Prabhupada, allegedly, and you will therefore be subordinate to those same devotees in the spiritual world forever. That horse crap trope should be thoroughly rejected by everyone. His leading secretaries believed and preached that except for his pet disciples and leading men, Prabhupada did not even know his other initiated disciples. They could only be known by his leaders, who, if they pleased that leader, could then introduce them to Prabhupada for the first time, despite the fact that he was their Diksha guru and had accepted them as initiated disciples and then initiated Brahmins. This false Prabhupada of so-called ISKCON serves institutional purposes and you should fully disavow it. You should fully disavow it vehemently. It is not who he was. It is not who he is. The ISKCON perspective of Prabhupada is both offensive and severely flawed, and it is institutionally motivated. Only fools buy into it. Now let us segue to consider the self-serving misconception of Prabhupada held by Niyamat, another Apasampradaya. It is very different from the image and ideal of him held by most in so-called ISKCON, but this should only have been expected. Inspired by Gaudiya Mutt, Neo Mutt is a splinter group from the mothership, but very inimical to Mother ISKCON. Neo Mutt wild cards were the second echelon men of significant power and prestige from yesteryear. In the late 70s and very early 80s, these rivals considered themselves to be gurus. The 11 great pretenders, who were imitating Prabhupada and thus minimizing him in that way, did not consider those other men to be gurus, and they were not willing to share the field. Thus, the envious second echelon men felt no loyalty to Prabhupada, or to the great pretenders, or to the new ISKCON system. Oh, as such, they picked up on Achilles' heel. The 11 great pretenders had relied too much on Swami B.R. Sridhar. In effect, and only to some degree, 
he had been replaced. He had replaced Prabhupada as the new figurehead authority that the Acharya board, created by his bad advice, relied upon. The initial second echelon then gamed the new system. They didn't respect it anyway. It wasn't going to give them what they wanted. So they took sannyas and new names from Swami B.R. Sridhar and became initiating spiritual masters in a separate universe from so-called ISKCON. They became the good stepson, the good stepsons of the Navadvip Mahant in the process, whereas the 11 great pretenders by the early 80s went into breakaway mode from him and they were now his prodigal sons. Neomut adopted the mood, style, philosophy, and outlook of its foster parent, along with the outlook of his organization, one which never fully accepted his divine grace through the Prabhupada in the right way at any time. Neomut shortly became known as the Maha Mandala. Having received their real initiations from Srila Prabhupada, he could not be entirely ignored, but he could be minimized, and that's the path they took. Now, previous to his coming to America in the mid-60s, he was also minimized by almost all of the Gaudi mud. One of the reasons for that was his householder status. When he took sannyas, however, that reason disappeared and his vast erudition had to be recognized. This is why Gaudi Amat awarded him the well-deserved title of Bhaktivedanta. Even then, in India, he was still minimized. He founded the Gwalior Mutt in Bombay, but was not allowed to run it. He created an ashram in Jhansi inside an already developed walled compound full of amenities. Still, his senior and most influential godbrothers, despite his invitation, would only join him there if he gave them full legal control of it. During those sannyas days, he was known as Swami Maharaj. This actually was little more than a backhanded compliment. In point of fact, he was minimized by this so-called accolade. Neomat did and does the same thing, although not so blatantly. Basically, they ignore him or minimize him, which means they ignore his glories and accomplishments. Oh, and now, which brings us to the conception, or rather the misconception, held by the most prominent splinter group from so-called ISKCON. Of course, we're referring to Ritvik here. As differentiated from both so-called ISKCON and Neomat, Ritvik is not merely a false school. It is a wrong school. It is an apasampradaya that is completely in error. To say that Ritvik over-glorifies Prabhupada is not entirely inaccurate. Nevertheless, it is more accurate to say that Ritvik presents Prabhupada as someone he is not and can never be. As you know, Ritvik claims that Prabhupada continued to be the Diksha Guru for the burnt remnants of his movement after his departure from physical manifestation. This is an anti-Vedic, anti-Vaishnav upasadanta, despite a handful of exceptional initiations dispensed long, long ago by divine beings or the Godhead directly. Those are utterly inapplicable today. The manifest initiating spiritual master accepts a disciple and links him to the disciplic succession at the time of initiation. Prabhupada formulated and formed an institution specifically for this. And that institution, post-1969, utilized Ritviks to conduct the ceremony on his behalf. At that time, the Diksha Guru also takes on the Sankshita Karma of his disciple. The Guru must be physically manifest in order to do so. But Ritvik ignores this integral principle of initiation. Instead, just like Christianity, from whence it has sprung, Ritvik posits that Prabhupada remains the initiating spiritual master even after he has left the scene. 
the scanty evidence that it uses to push this preposterous deviation is so flimsy and full of bad logic that it can hardly even be called evidence. It is light years away from being conclusive proof. Ritvik, like so-called ISKCON, is Prabhupada-centered. We've mentioned this before. But it's Prabhupada-centered in another way, a wrong way. Although both Neomut and Ritvik are breakaways from the mothership, and although they both hold a wrong image in imagination as to who Prabhupada was and is, there can never be any possibility of unity between these two breakaways. They are polar opposites. As such, there is no valid comparison between them. Ritviks are all over the place. The Ritvik, the Ritvik movement, if you can even call it that, is highly centrifugal, as it is subject to mental speculation constantly. It has to be, because it has no Vedic or Vaishnava foundation. After all, it was founded upon mental speculation, so mental speculation must continue in it, leading to more and more splinter groups. To describe the various Ritviks, to describe all their groups and many permutations of philosophy, to describe their belief systems, would be tangential to the chief point, which is that a spiritual master does not continue to be an initiating guru after he is no longer physically manifest. Such an image of him is flawed and offensive. Prabhupada was empowered by the Supreme Lord, but he was never that Supreme Godhead. He could never change the initiation system as it is perennial. As such, he only established a Ritvik system while he was here, and even that was truncated on at least one occasion, having had to be rejuvenated during his final months. Individual Ritviks with their Back to Prabhupada magazine and so many other concoctions are also also often fanatics. One such fellow, an actual initiate of Prabhupada, says that his divine grace will be the only initiating guru on earth for the next millions of years. How can any sane devotee take any of these ritviks seriously? Prabhupada must be glorified in the right way, which means to accept him as Shiksha Guru if you are not initiated by him. If you are not genuinely initiated by him during the 11 years that he conducted such initiations, in the 70s, entirely through the agency of Ritviks on his behalf, then you are now to accept him as your Shiksha Guru. This is the right conception, the right path, and it produces the right results. It is incumbent upon your host speaker to present, in synopsis, the actual image of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. As such, for your edification and realization, here it is. Point one, Prabhupada was the founder Acharya of a branch of the Madhva Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya meant primarily on the orders of his spiritual master to spread Krishna consciousness to the Western world. Point two, Prabhupada was an Uttam Adhikari during the years that he formulated, formed, and established his movement throughout the world. The Mahabhagavat worship he took was thus entirely appropriate. Point three, Prabhupada was a Shaktyavesh avatar empowered specifically to spread Krishna consciousness in a very potent and unprecedented way. Point four, Prabhupada was never dependent upon his disciples or followers for either his maintenance or protection. He received both from Godhead at all times. Point five, Prabhupada produced voluminous books of transcendental knowledge in the English language unparalleled in the history of Vaishnavism 
and these will eventually be recognized as the law books of mankind. Point six, Prabhupada had all 23 mystic powers in full. He rarely used them, but there were some occasions where he did employ, employ them. Point seven, Prabhupada did not name or empower a successor. Point eight, Prabhupada did not formally or officially appoint any disciple to be Diksha Guru. Point nine, Prabhupada established a ritvic system for conducting initiation ceremonies on his behalf while he was physically present, but he never intended it to perpetuate after his departure from physical manifestation. Point 10. Prabhupada was the best disciple of his spiritual master. Point 11. Prabhupada accomplished more than any of his godbrothers in pleasing his spiritual master. Indeed, he accomplished more than all of them combined, as in far more. Point 12. Prabhupada was vastly superior in purity, knowledge, power, realization, love, and personal prowess than any of his godbrothers. Point 13. Prabhupada knew it well that his leading secretaries were already in the process of deviating from both his orders and his wishes during his final years with us. What to speak of what went down after his departure. And finally, point 14. Prabhupada can save you at the time of death if you are ready and qualified to be saved as long as you were dedicated to him during your life. He can save you or contribute to your deliverance whether your relationship with him was as an initiated disciple or as his shiksha disciple. There are many more points to be made about him about the right conception of Prabhupada, but these 14 that I've just delineated should suffice. If you think that anything good is going to come from the misconceptions of Prabhupada held by so-called Iskand, held by Niyamat, and held by Ritvik, you are sorely mistaken. Based upon their misconceptions of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, if you think that any of those Appasampradayas is going to spread genuine Krishna consciousness, then you just haven't been paying attention. Sadeva Samya.